believe in the blood of Jesus. Watch as white as snow, I believe in the power of the gospel. She makes the broken whole. I believe in the curse of sin was broken. When you rolled away that stone, I believe, I believe, I believe. And I'll bow before you, Lord. I will rise.
How many were blessed by last week's service? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Psalm 23, the presence of the Lord. I mean, listen, the Holy Spirit went in there. Like we went in there and, and things were exposed. We started talking about yokes that were misaligned and faith that was misaligned and, and, and the soul and the spirit and the flesh and, the, and all these different things. And listen, I, I, I've just been pressing into that all week and just pressing into more of that. And I really believe that God has got something powerful lined up for us today. And let's jump straight in this afternoon. Uh, this scripture that I'm going to share with you right now, it's not on the screen, but I wanted, I wanted to share it with you. And this is in preparation for the sermon that's coming. James chapter 1, verse 21 to 22. I, I, want, to, I, want, I want to get us to, to speak this. As I speak it, would you speak it also and repeat it after me? I believe this is going to help us. I felt the Lord tell me this, that this is going to help us in preparation with God's work today. It says this, so get rid of all filth and evil in your lives. Well, let's try that again, church. Come on. I know you want to hear about the blessing and how good God wants to make you feel. But in order to get to the blessing, sometimes you have to remove some things first. Here we go. So get rid of all the filth and the evil in your lives and humbly accept the word of God. The word of God that he's planted in your hearts for it has the power to save your souls don't just listen to God's word you must do what it says otherwise you're only fooling yourselves <laughs> Father we just commit this day into your hands this preaching, this time Continue to move as you've been flowing already, Holy Spirit. Let the anointing ministry of the Holy Spirit flow. As I'm speaking, Lord, would you be moving amongst the aisles, Holy Spirit, touching each of each and every single one of us personally, intimately, in ways that only you can. We're here today because we love you and we thank you and we worship you. But we're also here today to receive more, to know more, to hear more. But not just to hear more, but to learn how to apply more. For it's the application of the truth that sets you free, not just the knowledge of it. Holy Spirit, help us today in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's go. If you're taking notes this afternoon, the message today is entitled Earmarked. Earmarked. This is part two of Psalm 23. Last week we spoke about soul care. We spoke about Psalm 23 verses 1, 2, and 3. You know, Psalm 23 is such a powerful psalm. We spoke about that last week. That's probably the most famous psalm within Scripture. It's recited at funerals, it's recited at deathbeds, it's recited in prison cells, come on somebody. It's recited in danger, it's recited to people who are struggling and anxious. Why? The reason is, is because it promises something, it reveals something of who God is. Mm. You know, remember last week we started off by that powerful declaration for 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Remember, David was declaring in his atmosphere, in his culture, and his surroundings that no matter what you see, no matter what you think, no matter who your God is, no matter what your choice is or your thing that you bow down to, David was saying, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And so today we're going to be looking at the last three verses, Psalm 23 verses 4 to number 6. It's on the screen behind me right now. I want to read it from the New King James Version. Ye though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me. All the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Somebody say amen. 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 One of the joys of being a parent, as you saw our kids when they came up here, 
one of our joys of one of the joys of being a parent, for those of you that are parents, is watching them grow and develop. Is watching them grow and develop and maturing and learning things and picking up step, uh, stuff and watching them go through the process of growth and development is fun, it's exciting, it's tiring, it's exhausting, the nappies, the late nights, right? You know, all these things, the process of growth is both exhilarating and exhausting at the same time. One of the areas of development that you see when you nurture kids and grow up kids is one of the developments you see is literally when they begin to take steps. Yeah. You know, their first step. Mm. You know, it's one of those most uh, things that's captured most on videos. Did you get the first step? Mm. And usually, from my understanding, they usually the first step comes in front of the dad. <laughs> no, I, I don't know why, but I know like, you know, the, the mums do all the hard work. They, they, you know, they, they carry them, they birth them, you know, they, they get up, you know, they do all the stuff. But for some reason, the, the baby sometimes, you know, they, 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 they take that first step in front of, in front of daddy, you know, and, uh, but it's a beautiful first step. But in order to take that first step, listen to me, in order to take that first step, you have to go through a process before that of crawling. There's a famous saying that says you can't walk before you crawl. You ever heard that before? Which means that there's a process to growth. There's a process to development. There's a process in maturity that can't be skipped. You see, when a baby takes it, when a baby begins to crawl, it's like, oh, look at it all crawling. Right? And then, and then you know what that does? It, it frees up, it, it, it gives, it's a breakthrough in dependency. It's kind of like the baby began to say, like, okay, I, I know you've carried me and I, I know you've, you know, you've created me for the last year, months and months. So, but, but now I'm ready to break free. Mm. Now I'm ready to start crawling. I'm ready to start developing. I'm ready to start maturing. I'm ready to start taking crawls and little, you know, crawls of faith. And then what happens is when the baby starts to crawl, starts to get a little bit more confident, then it starts to crawl and it starts to put its hands up on the couch. <laughs> Next minute you know the baby's standing holding on to the couch and its legs are... <laughs> get it, get it, I'll shake his feet. You know, it's looking back at you like that. <laughs> but then the baby starts to get a bit, a bit more confident. And it starts to hold onto the couch. Then it starts to kind of walk to the side. It's not a bit wobbly, but it starts to walk and it starts to grow. And eventually, you know, the couch runs out. <laughs> and it's like, there's nowhere else to go. <laughs> Let me just take that step of faith. Let me just. And it usually, usually ends with a flat, face flat down on the carpet, you know, cut, you know, eating the carpet. But it steps in dependency, steps in development. Uh, and in other words, there's a process in our development that you can't run before you can walk. In other words, you can't skip the process of growing. The word process, if you look at the word process in the dictionary, it means this, a series of actions and steps taken in order to achieve a particular goal or a particular end. Another translation says this, the word process means to progress, sorry, to progress and to advance. Mm -hmm. To process, to move forward. Now the reason I decided to share this psalm in two, piece, two places was for this very purpose. But I believe that in the psalm, I believe David, I believe there's hidden keys, I believe there's a process within Psalm 23 that if we would catch this, will really help us in year 23. Yeah. But I believe the key to part two <coughs> is found in part one. All right? Part one, David's talking about spending time in God's presence. He's talking about being led by the shepherd to the green meadows and the still waters, the place of restoration and healing. That's what he talks about first. And then he talks, so he talks about first, first thing he talks about is green meadows and still waters. Before he talks about valleys and death. You see, I came to tell you this afternoon and share with you this afternoon that I believe the key to the valleys and the key to the shadows of death is found in the green pastures and in the still waters. There's, there's a process that if we skip, 
that we'll find ourselves in trouble. <clears throat> There's a quote that I read in a book a long time ago, and it was a book about army, and a book about forces, and a book about war, and things like that. And it says this the more you sweat in training, the less you bleed in combat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Come on, come on, sure. The more preparation and practice you put in in the unseen times, that when you come to the fight, when you come to the battle, you can go in there securely because you've been training and preparing already for the battle. The problem is sometimes in Christianity, uh, we we don't spend time preparation, we don't spend time in God's presence. So when we start to walk through the valleys and the shadows of the shadows of death, and the valleys and the moments, yeah. we, we, we do get fearful and we yeah. do get afraid yeah. and we do get beat up. Why? Because we've not spent time in the green pastures and in the still waters. Mm-hmm. The key to the valleys and the key to the shadows of death, the key to prospering there, is found in the preparation stage of spending time in the green pastures and time in the still walls, having your soul restored. You see, when you're in the presence of God, in the personal secret place in your own life, and you're spending time with God, I'm not just talking about, Lord, bless this food, bless my day, you know, (laughs) bless me this and bless me that. I'm talking about actually settling down and taking time to spend time in the presence of our Savior. You remember the Savior that when you first got saved, you couldn't wait to get any prayer? Or you couldn't wait to open the Bible? Or you couldn't wait to get, you can't get to church? I want to get straight to the altar? Or can I wait to, oh, I just love the Lord so much? Reading the Psalms, reading the Proverbs, you know, Psalm and Proverb, but day keeps the devil away. (laughs) (laughs) And so this afternoon I want to share with you four points or four keys that are going to help us unpack and understand the remainder of this powerful Psalm. Are you ready? Yeah. Key number one, the key of preparation. The key of preparation. Going back to the reason why I felt God separate these this psalm into two sessions was that because I don't want us just to rush through this psalm and miss what David is trying to tell us. You know, sometimes we're guilty of knowing a scripture, knowing a certain passage of the Bible, and you read it, but you don't really read it. I've read that millions of times. I know the Lord's my shit. Okay. But are you really reading it? Are you really seeing what God's telling you? Are you really breaking it down verse by verse? Are you really understanding what the shepherd is trying to get through to us? So I don't want us just to rush through Psalm 23 and say, that was great. Praise God, shut the Bible, amen, go home and say nothing and do nothing and we just end up the same. Back in the 90s, I decided to join the forces in the army. I decided to join the army when I was young. And uh, to, get in, to get into the army, I had to pass a, a test called the BFT, which is a basic fitness test. That basic fitness test was just to make sure that I had a basic level of fitness to get in. When I got into the army and I was accepted, I went then underwent another 12 weeks of basic training, which all of that was, again, was preparation to prepare and to test me and to try me to see if I had the goods to go through the next stage. There was a process of preparation. I never just became a soldier overnight. Although I signed up for the army, and I was I had an army number and an army ID and had all these things, on paper, I was a soldier. But in reality, I wasn't. I still had a lot of developing and a lot of growth to do and a lot of understanding and a lot of developing and a lot of skills I needed to learn and a lot of processes and a lot of preparation I needed to go through. Then when I got to my army base in a place called Abingdon just outside Oxford, I then also had to go through regular BFTs, which then went to CFTs, which were basic fitness tests was three miles, CFT was eight miles, but that was also carrying a bear gun and a rifle and a boots and a helmet, etc. All that different things. And so even when I passed out and was an actual bona fide soldier, I was still required to live a life of preparation. 
that I was not just to say, well, that's me, I've made it now. That's me, I've reached my goal. That's me, I'm, I'm in church now. That's me, I'm, uh, I know Psalm 23. That's me, I, I give an offering. That's me, I, I attend a certain group and I, I'm part of a certain ministry and I'm part of a certain thing and I, and I do all these things. That's me, I've made it now, I can relax. You see, the key to winning the battle was the preparation in the times of peace. When an army goes to war, they go to war and they're prepared. The special forces, when they go to a, an assignment somewhere, before they get launched and dropped into the, the hot zone, they've already been preparing for that hot zone all their life. They jump out of airplanes, they go through walls, they, 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 they jump over mines, they, they do all these things. Why? Because the preparation for the battle comes in the times of peace. Too often, as believers, we skip the peace and we just head straight into the battle. Is there any wonder why we get slapped around? Is it any wonder why we fall and stumble? Is it any wonder why we, you know, we, we, we get used and abused like, a, like an old circus mule? If we're not spending time in preparation. I can see this with all my heart before the Lord. I got up most mornings early in the morning before the kids wake up. Why? Because I need preparation. I need God's presence in my life. I need his word in my spirit. I need to be refreshed and renewed. I need the word of God in my heart. I need to repent. I need to be restored. I need to be filled on a daily basis. For that way when the valleys come and the shadows of death comes and the enemy comes knocking on my door, he can come knocking on my door. But because I've been in the presence of God, because I've been in my secret place, because I've been in the tent of prayer, enemy knocks and the valleys come and the shadows come and the temptations come and the madness come but I don't face them in my own flesh I don't face them in my own strength I don't face them in my own wisdom I stand here in the presence of God and say Lord I'm filled, I'm whole I'm healed, I'm restored and I'm prepared Amen. for this battle Amen. Amen. That's it. Amen. the key to winning the battle was in the preparation in the times of peace yes. I think we can learn from that quote yeah. As Michael has, it's pretty good though. <laughs> but before David talks about the valleys and the shadows of death, he talks first about being led into green pastures and still waters. Before he talks about valleys and shadows of death, he talks about places of nourishing, places of restoration, places of encouragement, places of hope, places where you're strengthened and healed and restored. Can I share with you this afternoon that at the heart of all of the Psalms of David, there was a relationship. I know that might seem like obvious, but at the heart of the Psalms of David was a relationship that he valued. That a relationship that he had built up over time. A relationship that he could count on in the times of troubles, in the times of trials. There was a relationship in David's heart with God and David knew from the times of stillness and from the times of prayer and from the times of quietness and from the times of restoration and from the times of loneliness and from the times of being abandoned that the world may abandon me, that my father may abandon me, that the world may abuse me, that I may be left alone and nobody else loves me. But I know that in the midst of the field and in the midst of the struggle and in the midst of my trials and in the midst of my weakness that God was right here to save me. That's why he can proclaim and that's why he can declare the Lord is my shepherd. It's all about a relationship. Let me just share a few words that David says. He says this, he lets me rest. He leads me. He renews my strength. This is all before he talks about valleys and shadows of death. Yeah. <laughs> 
He lifts me into the rest. He leads me. He renews my strength and he guides me. This is all before he even mentions shadows of death and bodies. And the statement of David's Psalms was a healthy relationship with Jesus. Ultimately, oh, Jesus hadn't came yet, but ultimately with the Lord. There was a healthy understanding. And David's trying to tell us this, and please don't miss this. There was a healthy understanding in David's Psalm, in Psalm 23. He's giving us the recipe. He's giving us the key to succeed in the dark times. He's giving us the key to succeed in the valleys. He's giving us the keys to succeed when all things seem like they're breaking loose against me. He's giving us the key to success in the kingdom of God. And the success in the kingdom of God isn't how much money you have, isn't how many clothes you have, how many cars you have, what you look like on a Sunday. The keys to success in the kingdom of God isn't how much scripture you can quote or how many times you've been in these meetings or that means success in the kingdom of God is found sitting at the feet of the Lord. David's understanding of a healthy relationship with God led to him having a healthy soul. You see, relationships, if I can just share on these for a moment, relationships are built through times of intimacy and they're tested through times of trials. You see, intimacy builds trust and levels of security. You know, when I say intimacy, I'm not talking necessarily about sex. I know sometimes when we hear that in church, we're going to be excited. Oh, he's talking sex. <laughs> I'm talking about honesty, mm-hmm. integrity, yeah. brokenness, yeah. vulnerability, yeah. sharing your heart, yeah. opening up, mm-hmm. fears, anxious, worries, cares, doubts, struggles. Mm-hmm. And so relationships are built through times of intimacy and they're tested in times of trials. You see, nothing... And please hear me this, I, I, I really felt the Lord really place this on my heart so strongly um, this morning as I was praying over this and reading over this this morning. Nothing breaks intimacy in relationships more than pornography. I can't talk to you guys and women about a healthy soul without talking about these things. In my earlier days of being a Christian, I don't mind saying I struggled with these things. It was natural and normal in my house. Not that it was overly used or overly abused, it just became normal. And these things were normalized. And and, and pornography, at its core, has a way of replacing intimacy with your loved one. It, It replaces it because it tricks you into thinking and watching intimacy. So I'm being intimate. But in fact, what it's doing is, is numbing your intimacy to the person who you should really be intimate with. Yeah. And so I'm not going to labor on that fact because we all understand what that is. But here's the thing. The Lord said to me this morning, I want you to speak to him about spiritual pornography. What do you mean by that, Pastor? I'll, let, me, let me tell you what I mean by this. We've replaced intimacy with God in the secret place with YouTube, with podcasts, with Facebook and social media. Here's what we've done. Here's what this culture has become. We think that by watching someone on YouTube sharing their intimacy and their level of breakthrough, that we're watching spiritual pornography because we're getting our needs met Watching someone else be intimate with God. And so we're sitting there taking all in the popcorn and. (laughs) And listen, I'm not against YouTube or Spotify or podcasts, but these things can't replace the source of intimacy with the Lord and Savior. I'm sorry, I can't just skip past. You know, I can come with a flowery message this morning, uh, today, and I praise God, and, I, and it will be flowery later. <laughs> but as some wise man once told me, sometimes you learn by the cut, not the stitch. Yeah. Yeah. And so spiritual pornography, if we're not careful, replaces our personal time of intimacy with God. 
We get up in the morning to pray and we stick on Elevation Church and we watch a preaching from this person and that person. And what we're doing is, is we think that we're having intimate time with God, but what we're really doing is we're watching someone else share how his intimate relationship with God. You can't replace intimacy with a video, with a podcast. These things numb the brain. They numb our intimacy. You want a healthy soul? Get into it with Jesus. Get into his presence like David says. Get into the green meadows. Let him meet you. Let him guide you. Let him restore you. Share your soul. Share your burdens. Release your cares and worries to him. Open up to him and allow him to come in and restore your soul. Then there will be health that flows from that. As a married man who's been married for coming up for eight years this year, on a personal level, my wife and I, when, when, I'm, with, when I'm this way, I feel like a people world. Like when we like, you know, with this, I had to get anybody with this woman by the side. I don't want to go anywhere. Go anywhere. Go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> we've had to build up this relationship mm-hmm. right we've had to bear our soul sometimes it's been difficult and <laughs> mm-hmm. it's difficult sometimes bearing your soul and bearing your ugliness and bearing your emotion mm-hmm. you know I'm supposed to be the pastor but again I'm getting I feel like I'm lying in the chancellor's chair <laughs> but here's what happens and please men listen I found this the hard way the way to intimacy isn't necessarily sex, mm. which is good. The way to intimacy in a closer relationship is vulnerability, mm. sharing your soul, sharing your mistakes. It's the same with God. Mm. It's not just about performance. It's not just about this and that. It's about actually spending time building up that intimate relationship. Mm. Developing that care, developing that trust, developing that understanding, developing an understanding of who he is. And here's what I know. Here's what I know. There's times when we're not alone. There's times when we're not together. There's times when we're apart. There's times when she's at work and different things and I'm doing different things and we're apart. Sometimes we're in different countries and different nations in America and she's there and I'm there or something like that. But just because we're apart doesn't separate the bond. You see, because what we've built up covers what's going to take place. What we've built up in the secret place and in the private place and in our private relationship, when struggles do come, we face them. Knowing that I love her and she loves me. Mm-hmm. And it's like that when we, when we walk with God. When you go through the dry times and the empty times and the struggles, which we will, when you do go through the valleys and the shadows of death, you know what's going to keep you? The intimate times you have before. Because although you may not feel his presence, you know that you've built up this relationship. And even though I don't feel him, I know he loves me. Even though I don't see him, I know he loves me. Even though I'm walking through this dark season right now, I know he has me. Because I've spent time with him. I've built up credit. I've put money into the bank. You see, you can't withdraw what you don't deposit. Sometimes as, as believers, man, we always want to, we always want to withdraw. Mm-hmm. Oh Lord, <laughs> get me out of this mess. Yeah. Help me, Lord. Mm-hmm. And he will, because he's gracious and he's kind and he's merciful. You see, relationships take work. Mm-hmm. You know when the honeymoon period drops off? Mm-hmm. And the little you stop sending the little love heart messages. 
Remember, it used to be you'd take messages a day. You're not giving you one anymore. <laughs> it takes work. It takes intentional work to develop the relationship. Mm. You see, in them times, you have to remember why, and you have to remember who. Mm. You see, it's easy just to say, you know what, forget it. I don't feel, can't sense it. I'm off. I'm out. I'm quit. I'm gone. But when you have a relationship with somebody, even in the dry times, you know that that person has my back and I have them. That I'm in this. I know, I know, listen, I know, I know, Zoe, man, listen, me and I'll be in this to the off caps all the time. I'll be in this to the end. We want to make sure that we spend time working on each other, working with each other, so that when the tough times do come, we have credit, we have credit to, to withdraw. You know where that credit comes from the Lord? Prayer. Worship. In his presence. Loving his presence. You see what David's ultimately saying by this through the green valleys and the still waters as he prepares you for the valleys and the shadows of death. David's ultimately saying this, that his presence prepares us for the places of persecution and pruning. His presence prepares us. His presence prepares us for the seasons that we're going to go through. His, seed, his presence prepares us for the dark seasons that were going to come. The seasons of his presence, the seasons of investing, the seasons of prayer, the seasons of time, the seasons of your prayers and your worship and your laying your life down. These are what enable you to walk through the seasons that come next. That's the key of preparation. And see, understanding this principle will help us focus during the valley moments. And this leads me to my second key. The key of perspective. You see in David's verse 4. And if you could have verse 4 back up on the screen. You see the perspective of David. In verse 4. That even when he's going through the valleys in the dark place. His word is this. I will not be afraid. Amen. Where does this bold, courageous perspective come from? The green pastures and the still meadows. Amen. That's where this bold, courageous statement comes from. Yeah, I walk through the valley. Yeah, it's dark. Yeah, it's scary. But I know my God. And I know that he is with me. And I will not be afraid. You see, because David spent time in God's presence, he received rest and he received soul care. He was able to have the right focus when he went through the struggles and the trials. He was able to say in the midst of the circumstances, he's not denying circumstances, he's not denying it's dark, he's not denying it's not a valley, but what he chooses to focus on, he chooses to focus on the times he remembers in worship, the times he remembers in healing, the times he remembers when God gave him the victory against Goliath, the bear, and the lion. As he's walking through the valleys and the dark seasons of his life, he's able to say, I will not be afraid because he's still the same God. I remember Goliath. I remember the field. I remember the attacks. I remember the warfare. If he never left me then, he's not going to leave me now. For the Lord is my shepherd. You remember St. Goliath fell? As he's going through the dark seasons. He remembers the anointing from the prophet. As he's called to the field. He remembers defending his father's sheep himself a shepherd. And he remembers the times that when wild animals were coming after him to kill him. That God gave him the victory in the field. See, he's not lying. He's not in deception. He's not trying to call things which are as if they're not. He's not trying to bluff his lines. He's saying, listen, it's a dark season and it's a wild season and I'm going through some things right now. He says, but I have the right perspective because I remember who my Lord is. I remember how far he's brought me. I remember how much he saved me. I remember when no one else wanted me, he wanted me. I remember he brought me through trials and tribulations and struggles. And because I remember who my God is, I will not fear. He chooses to regulate 
Sorry, he chooses to relegate. Same word, different spell. He chooses to relegate. He chooses to relegate his soul to the back seat of decision making. Mm. My God, if you can if you can cast that in your spur. He chooses to relegate his soul to the back seat of the car in decision making and direction. Because he, he's, he's facing darkness. He's facing valleys. He could easily cave in. Oh Lord, where are you, God? Oh Jesus, help me, Lord. He could easily cave in and wither. But because his perspective is right. See, this, watch this. Because he spent time in the green gardens and the green meadows. Because he spent time in the still waters. Because he spent time in the presence of God getting his soul restored. He's able to make decisions. Watch this. Not based on what he sees. But based on who he is. You understand when your soul has been healed or is being healed, when you don't keep making the same decisions, you're in the valley, you're in a season, you're in a moment, and you're not denying that. But your choices now reflect a soul that's been healed and being restored. Some of us, I think, maybe sometimes when we're facing situations and trials, we need to learn to relegate or sold to the back seat of a car when making decisions and taking directions. Yes. Mm. You want to make better decisions? Yes. You want to see better things happen? Yes. Relegate the soul. Tell the soul, say, get behind me. <laughs> soul, get behind me. Listen, I don't know what we're facing this afternoon, but you may just have to be bold and courageous and start making declarations like addiction, get behind me. Broken marriage, get behind me. Sickness, get behind me. Poverty, get behind me. And today, if we would catch this, that we would take some things that have been guiding us and directing us and leading us, and we would say today is the day that our relatives receiving the scriptures. Listen, but when the enemy comes and, and temptation comes and smacky jacky comes and juicy lucy comes and, and all these different things, when all these things start coming and taking place in your life, who's going to answer the door? Oh. Oh. <laughs> 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 who's going to take the wheel? See, time and preparation gives you the right perspective. Time in God's presence will allow you to see the situation, but will also give you the right perspective as you walk through the situation. Key number three is this is the key of position. You see, what's this? We, we, we don't, as believers, we don't work for salvation, right? We work from salvation, right? Meaning that our starting place as a believer is a starting place of victory. You see, on the cross of Calvary, when Jesus, the great shepherd, he paid the price for you and I, by his very own blood, he paid it for you and I to be part of his shepherd, be part of his flock. You see, now, I can't even tell you this afternoon, if you didn't know it, you're now under new ownership. You're now under new ownership. You have a new owner. You belong to a new flock. You belong to a new herd. 
You see, back in the old days and still in these days, what shepherds would do, and they still do today, is they would take a sheep personally and they would pierce the ear of the sheep with an, identified, with an identification tag or a mark upon the ear that declared that the sheep belonged to the shepherd and a certain herd. Listen, I keep you shouting to somebody this afternoon. Listen, you are earmarked. Yeah. You are earmarked by Jesus. He's bought you. He's purchased you. He paid for your sin. He paid for your mess by the cross of Calvary. That when he shed your blood as a ransom, he bought you for a price. You're not under your old man. You're a new creation. You have a new owner now. You belong to a new field. You're part of a new tribe. You're part of a new hair. And that's in your earmark. Number one, you're earmarked from a place of security. That as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I know that I may feel alone, but I'm earmarked. I'm tagged. That means I belong to someone. That means I've got a shepherd that I may be lost. But my Bible tells me that he leads the name to name. Look at your neighbor and see your earmarked. Yeah. Ephesians 1 verse 13, you and in a national version says this. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him. Let me say that again. Ephesians 1 verse 13. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him. You see, watch this. Our position of security is based on the knowledge that we've been purchased by a price. Our foundation and our position in Christ is based upon the fact that we've been earmarked for a specific purpose and a specific place that God has for our life. You see, your position and your key of position and security is in the fact that you have a new owner. His name is Jesus. He's the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And nothing is impossible through him. He's your Lord and your Savior. And he's placed you under new ownership. And he's placed you in a new herd. That is our place of position. These are the places of position and the, and, and, and the way that we fight our battles. We fight them by knowledge in God that we've been bought by a price, that we have a saviour in Jesus, that he earmarked us for a specific purpose and a specific plan. I keep to tell you today, when you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, there were gifts and talents and skills and abilities and a calling upon your life that became active on that day of salvation. You are earmarked for a specific calling and a specific purpose. Some of you in this place are earmarked for ministry. Some of you in this place are earmarked to be evangelists. Some of you in this place are earmarked to be faithful husbands and wives. Some of you in this place are earmarked to be apostles, to be preachers, to be pastors, to be teachers. Some of you in this place are earmarked to run recovery homes, recovery centers, recovery programs. Some of you in this place are earmarked for God to do great and mighty things through. Listen, you may just be a lonely sheep. You may just be bad, bad, bad. But listen, there's a calling and a plan upon your life that the enemy will try and rob you from. And as you go through the valleys and as you go through the darkness, you may fear and you may seem and it may seem dark. But as you go through the season and as you go through the troubles and as you go through the darkness, your place of position is this. Yeah, I may be going through a struggle, a struggle, a little struggle right now. But I know whose I am. I know whose I am. That is the position we battle for. We battle from a place of victory, yeah. knowing whose we are. Mm -hmm. Brothers and sisters, in person and online, you've been earmarked for a specific purpose. Bought with a price. The shepherd always bought his flock. And when he got them, he made them and identified them as their own. Mm -hmm. That if they got lost, they always remembered whose they were. Mm -hmm. There was always an identifying tag on them that said, I belong to this shepherd. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Brothers and sisters, that's our place of position as we go through these struggles. Not only are you called into a particular herd, but the shepherd, he also anointed his sheep. As the band can come back, the worship band can come back. I want to share with you here just a key of the scriptures can be put back up this afternoon. It says this. Even as I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head, and my cup overflows with blessings. Yeah. Let me just share for you a real quick and real, real thing. The anointing. Now a shepherd would anoint the sheep. It's, a, it's anointing oil. And the shepherd would pour the oil over the head of the sheep. And the oil, watch this, would protect the sheep from parasites and bugs and stuff that would try from the outside, stuff that would try and get in. You see, the anointing oil of God was protective, but was also for the purpose of productivity. It was to protect it from the outside elements, but it was also to keep it whole, keep it pure, and keep it protected for what God's plan was for that sheep. It was a layer of protection from the outside. It was a layer of protection from the shepherd that protected the sheep from the elements around them. You know, I spoke about many things today. I've spoken about, you know, pornography, spiritual pornography. And I know maybe that's something you don't like to hear about. But if I'm honest, I'm talking about so here. It's something that's really, really deep within this generation. I've talked about spending time in the presence of our Lord and Saviour. I've talked about spending time in the green meadows and the still waters having our soul restored. Because it's in those moments that prepare us for the valleys and the dark seasons. I've spoken about the perspective. I've spoken about the perspective. That spending time in preparation gives us the perspective of faith. But we don't try, you know put our head under the sand as Christians and, 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 and pretend nothing happens. But because of the preparation and the time in God's presence, we're able to look at our situations and say, yes, they're dark. Yes, it may be troubling. Yes, it may be struggling. Yes, there may be a lot of things trying to get into me from the outside. But because I know my God, my perspective through this struggle is, He's always with me. Yes. He's never left me. He gave me victory over Goliath. He gave me victory over this. He gave me victory over that. He pulled me out of the rubble. He pulled me out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a solid rock. He gave me hope. He gave me healing. He gave my mind back. He gave me my marriage back. He gave me my children back. He gave me a love for God. He gave me a love for people. He gave me health. I'm healthy today because of him. I can come to church today because of him. I got joy. I got life. I got expression. I got exuberance. I got worship. I got a house. I got I've got a bed, I've got a TV, I've got a car, and guess what? It's all because of him. In the midst of the season, in the midst of the valley, in the midst of the darkness, David remembers this time in the secret place. He remembers this time playing the violin to the Lord and playing that thing in the shepherd's field. He remembers the time when the presence of God fell, when it was just him playing a tune to God, singing a song to him in the midst of the field, just minding his own business, just playing that thing for Jesus. He remembers the time when he was protected from the animals and the wild animals. He remembers the times of victory. He remembers the times of overcoming solutions, overcoming problems that seem much bigger than him. We can see that David's perspective helped relegate his soul to the back seat when making decisions. Because he said, listen, I pretending that my situation is not rough right now. But what I do do is I fix my eyes on Jesus. I remember who he is. I remember what he's done. I remember if it wasn't for him, I'd still have a needle in my arm. If it wasn't for him, my parents would have a son that was dead by now. If it wasn't for him, I would have no children, have no wife. If it wasn't for him, I would have no mind. My mind would be broken. If I wasn't dead, I'd probably be psyched to it somewhere, biting blankets and licking windows in a ward. If it wasn't for him, 
And so today, Zoe and myself, we're not ever people that just, you know, come and just deny reality. But we face reality. But we face reality from a position and a perspective of faith. Faith in Jesus. Faith in who he is. Faith that he's able to turn things around. Faith that he's able to heal me. Faith that he's able to give me the breakthrough. Faith that he's able to provide for me. Faith that he's able to overcome. Faith that he's able to take me through this dark season. Faith that he's able to take me through the shadows. Faith that he's able. Because of what he's done in my life already. And I just have to remind you that the key of position You have to remember in the times of the valleys and the times of the seasons, you have to remember that you're earmarked. You're not your own. I know we still like to think we are. But you're earmarked. You have a new owner now. We are purchased for, by a price, and that price was the blood of Jesus upon the cross of Calvary. His blood paid the ransom for you and I. At that moment when we accepted Jesus, we were released. All charges were dropped. Praise the Lord. And I don't know if you had a few charges going against me. But that's the position that we fight from. We fight from the place of victory. We fight from the place of hate. I know that maybe I'm wondering a little bit right now, but I know my owner is Jesus. And I know that maybe I'm not exactly where I used to be or where I thought I'm going to be, but I know you come looking for me. Let's stand to our feet this afternoon. Maybe my wife will come back to me. You know, what we're going to do right now is we're going to do a time of anointing. The shepherd would take the oil and he would get his flock together. And he would come and he would get them and he'd, he'd look at that sheep and, and I'm sure he looked at the stubborn one first. <laughs> and he'd get that stubborn sheep or even he'd get the black sheep. Say, hey, you need some anointing upon your life. Because there's some things out there that are going to challenge you. There's some things that are going to come against you. There's some things that are going to try and take you out. But he said, I love you so much. But I'm going to pour this anointing on you. And I'm going to believe that this anointing is going to protect you in this next season. And this anointing is going to protect you and keep you. But not only that, this anointing is going to be the of the land. To the same Jesus in the Just want to speak.